where you stand right now. Most of you have probably already completed uh, the FAFSA, got it all filled out. Uh, if there was any information that was requested from our office to complete what is called verification, that is a federal process where uh, they randomly select different FAFSAs and ask uh, the schools themselves to collect information from the families and just verify certain pieces of the FAFSA because there is a lot of information that, that uh, has been submitted on that FAFSA. So hopefully you've gotten all that done. Uh, once that's been completed, uh, as you're aware, the FAFSA is a generalized form from the standpoint of trying to be able to use a formulation that'll be standardized enough to help process aid eligibility for over 27 million students that'll be attending college uh, each year. But of course, as we all know, not all of those questions get answered exactly the same by you all. Everyone has their own individual uh, scenarios, circumstances that may come up. So if you've had that scenario, those scenarios like uh, one of my, you know, one of the parents lost a job, or you had excessive medical bills, or some other things along those lines, colleges have the capability to evaluate your special circumstance uh, in the form of collecting some supplemental data from you. We'll com complete that uh, process, and we can be able to make an adjustment to uh, the student's FAFSA to determine if there's a change in their eligibility, which may make you know, more aid available for everyone. Uh, now, whenever you're, you're filing your FAFSA, it provides you with uh, a result. It's a numerical result called an EFC, an Expected Family Contribution. That is basically the federal government's determination using that standardized process to determine how much funding you as a family can be able to contribute towards your student's education. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you actually believe that the EFC number that was provided on your FAFSA really was the amount that you could be able to provide? That's kind of what I thought. I don't see any hands up. So like I said, it may not necessarily be exactly the way your situation you feel it might be, but that's where the communication comes in line to where when you contact the financial aid office, uh, you can talk with myself, Tim Wolf, uh, my other staff members, uh, we're more than happy to try to help address your scenario to see if there might be some eligibility for some other um, aid options to be able to help you out. And then once we've done all of that, you should have received an award letter. From the beginning freshman standpoint, you would have received uh, an actual paper letter in the mail, and it would come in a, in a large envelope with a number of other inclus uh, inclusions within that, uh, that mailing. Uh, one of those things would be uh, what we call is an IT sheet, which is actually your student's login and password for uh, getting into their Raven Zone. That is going to be one of their primary focuses in terms of receiving information and knowing what they're going to be dealing with in the next four years. So uh, make sure that your students uh, retain that information because that's where they're not only going to be able to see their financial aid, they're going to be able to get in and view their student bill, they're going to be able to uh, look at their grades, they'll be able to help set their classes in future semesters. The Raven Zone is their connection point here on campus, so they need to make sure that they're retaining that information with them. So what we need to do now, the students have got their, their award letter, they need to make sure that they've gone in and accepted that award letter. Now, on the award letter, there are two different types of aid that will be on there. One is called gift aid. Everyone likes gift aid. Right? Everybody wants free money. Right? That's the best thing. No one's going to turn that down. So from that standpoint, we're going to look at the gift aid is going to be on the student's account ready to go. But there will also be some student loans if your student is eligible for student loans. With that, we, will be required, we are required to make sure that if a student wants to utilize their student loans, they have to tell us that they want that. So by that means, they will have to go out to the Raven Zone and they'll go into the section that's called their student self-service. That's where they'll be able to view their award letter. They'll need to go in and accept that award letter. And then there's another step where they'll have to actually sign it. That is their official notification that, yes, I want these, these, uh, this entire loan uh, award package. Whether they want the loans or not, they can accept or decline the individual components. So we will need to make sure we have that done in order for us to be able to process their financial aid in time 
for the due dates that Becky will be talking about with regards to uh, the student's uh, billing account. Now, if, if any students, we've, we've been very fortunate here at Benedictine College. We, we've got a lot of really bright, smart kids. They are going out and they are finding opportunities to look at not only what can Benedictine College provide in terms of uh, scholarships, maybe there's federal, federal and state grant availability, but many of these students are going out and looking at outside sources, you know, going to the Knights of Columbus, the Kiwanis Clubs, all of the local entities that they have the opportunities to access, and they're applying for scholarships. If your student has done this, they would be, if they receive this, those scholarships, they'll get some kind of a, usually a notification via the mail. There'll be some kind of a letter that they'll receive saying, congratulations, you have received the XYZ scholarship, and it will be for the amount of $1,000 or whatever it might be. In order for us to help process that, many of these entities will send the checks to the college or they may send the check to the student, but it'll have the college's name on it. So from that standpoint, what we would ask is if you would please forward to us a copy of that letter. What we will then be able to do is add it to their award letter so that way we can have a tracking of that so when the, let, when the check actually comes, we can get it applied to the student's account quickly because we don't want to delay anything if at all possible. So the more information we know about that, the more we appreciate that and we can make sure that your student is being taken care of. So anything we can do there, we appreciate now, if your student is going to be utilizing student loans, of course, within the media right now, we, you know, over the years, we've heard how students are just being laden with so much student debt. Well, the one thing we want to make sure of is that this is not the case from the standpoint that, it's, that the college is just saying, here, you've got a loan. You've got to take it. And someone says, well, I didn't know I was taking a loan. That's not going to be the case. So what we end up doing is there are a couple things that a student will have to do proactively to make sure that yes, they do understand that they are taking a loan and we need to make sure that they understand the ramifications, their rights, their responsibilities that come with having that student loan. So the first thing that is done is, is having their uh, entrance counseling completed. It's a federal process and what will happen is they will go out to the website is www. Uh, studentloans.gov, that's a plural, studentloans.gov, and we'll refer to it here a little later in the presentation. But within that website, the student will log in to that federal website with the same FSA ID and password that they used when they filed their FAFSA. So everything that is relevant on the federal side, they're trying to keep everything consistent with one login and password. So the student will go out and complete their entrance counseling. It'll take 10 to 15 minutes, it will talk about all the different things, the interest rates, uh, repayment terms, rights and responsibilities, everything that, that's relevant to their student loans. They'll go through and complete that process. When they get to the end of that process, it will also ask them, would you now like to sign your master promissory note? As is the case with whether you're buying a car or a home or borrowing any kind of money, there is a master promissory note that is required that is basically the borrower's agreement to repay those funds. So they can do all of this at that one website. Once that's all completed, within usually 48 hours, the college will communicate with the Department of Ed asking, has this student completed their requirements? We will get notification back from the Department of Ed. Once we have that notification and they're signed a word letter saying that they want their student loans, we can process their loans accordingly. And we can get them on their account uh, quickly uh, within the appropriate time to be able to help meet the deadlines as with their student bill. Now, on the student's award letter, the, the aid that they've received, their grants, scholarships, uh, student loans that they've accepted, may or may not cover their entire bill. Whatever's left over, according to the Department of Ed, is the responsibility of the parents. Congratulations. But from that standpoint, you know, now it becomes a, a scenario of what are my options? Now, what we've done on your award letter, on your student's award letter, is we have applied what is called a Parent PLUS loan. P-L-U-S stands for Parent Loan for Undergraduate Student. That is a loan, a credit-based loan, that a parent can take out on behalf of their student to help pay any remaining 
educational expenses at that college for that year that may not be covered by the students' uh, student loan eligibility, their grants, and their scholarships. So if the parents would wish to do that, they will go to the same website, studentloans.gov, and they can be able to apply for the Parent PLUS loan much in the same manner that the student will end up doing their entrance counseling and signing their master promissory note. One key factor, if you are considering the Parent PLUS loan option, when you would go to this website, you need to make sure that you are logging in as the parent, not as the student. So don't use the student's login as they use for the password. You will use your login that was used to help sign your student's FAFSA. So make sure that you're, you're following through. Every year we see some scenarios where uh, this, it shows that the student is the borrower instead of the parent being the borrower. When we see that, we have to decline that. That is not an eligibility thing. So with that, please be aware that that needs to be under the parent's name. Um, now, some parents say, this is my student's education. This is their responsibility to pay for. So I'm not going to take a parent loan out. This is their thing. So if that's going to be the case, another option that's available is what we call an alternative or a private loan. These are loans that a student can take out through an entity such as uh, Sally May, Wells Fargo, uh, Discover, the credit card company, they have a student loans division. These companies provide student loans that can be taken out by the student instead of it being falling on the parents. But keep in mind, in most cases, these loans will require the student to have at least a two-year credit history. And that's not usually going to be the case when it comes to an 18-year-old student. So, while the parent may not have to take out the Parent PLUS loan if they don't want to, you might want to consider as to whether or not you're willing to co-sign for that student loan. It would require a co-signer. And the interest rates on those loans, depending upon who the, the uh, lender is, is usually dictated by the credit score of that co-signer. So I had a question yesterday from, from a parent. Well, if, we get a, if, the, if my student gets a private loan, and the interest rate is better than their unsubsidized loan, can we just do that and not do the unsubsidized loan? Absolutely. Those are options that are available to you. You know, ultimately the issue is you're, you're going to need to determine how is it that your student's education expenses are going to be covered. So we're more than willing to work with you on any manner that we need to be able to do that. To give you a little bit of background, uh, Many of us as parents, and I say parents, I've had already had three kids go through college right now. Uh, if we've attended college, we remember the Stafford Loan Program. It is now referred to as the Federal Direct Student Loan Program because the Stafford Loan Programs, you could choose who you were taking the loans out through. Now everything is run through the Department of Education. You apply directly through the department, and that is where everything's taken care of, and then they will assign that loan to uh, someone who will service that loan for the student. Uh, there are two types of loans that a student can be qualified for. It is going to be a subsidized loan and an unsubsidized. The, the difference between the two, the interest rates are the same. The repayment periods are the same. They won't have to make payments on these loans until after they've either graduated or they've uh, become enrolled less than half time, which means less than six hours. So if a student decides to take a semester off, then that six month uh, ticker is gonna start rolling for them. So they need to be aware of that. So those, those two aspects are exactly the same. The, the main difference between them is the fact that with the subsidized loan, the interest that would normally accrue is paid by the Department of Education. So if you were to say which of the two is better for me to take as a student, the subsidized would because while you're in school, you have no interest accruing. The unsubsidized, you would. So those are the big things to look at. At the bottom of the screen, you'll notice there's a reference over the past couple of years, the Department of Ed has Im implemented an origination fee that will come out of the student's loan proceeds. Uh, with, when it comes to the, the, uh, the direct loans for the student, uh, the, the rate is 1.069. So if they were taking out $1,000 in an unsubsidized student loan or a subsidized loan, then they're gonna, we're going to remove or, or withhold, the Department of Ed will, will withhold that 1%, a little over 1%. So instead of getting $1,000, they'll get 990 
those funds are not withheld by us, those are withheld by the Department of Ed. If, as a parent, you're gonna use the Parent PLUS loan, the origination fee is a little bit steeper. It's sitting right now at a 4.276. So if you were taking a $10,000 Parent PLUS loan, then you're looking in the neighborhood there of getting about $9,600. Just kind of as a ballpark figure. So be, please be aware of that. This is the website that, we were, that I was referring to, the studentloans.gov website. This is where the student can be able to log in. They'll be able to see where it says where that are the items that are circled with regards to their entrance counseling and their master promissory note. Those are needed. If you're going to do a Parent PLUS loan, then you're going to be doing the Parent PLUS, you're going to request a Parent PLUS loan and you will sign a master promissory note. So it's very similar with the two of them. Just please remember, if you're logging in to be able to take a Parent PLUS loan, then you need to log in as yourself as the parent, not as the student. Some of you, I, I put this slide up just as a quick reference. Some of you may have been looking at uh, multiple colleges and there may or may not have been reference, uh, whether it's in the news or at some colleges with regards to the Perkins Loan Program. Uh, the Perkins Loan Program was a very, uh, has been a very beneficial program for both colleges and students. Uh, it's a low interest rate, rate loan available for high need students. Currently, Congress, uh, it is set in place to expire September 30th. So along those lines, Benedictine College will not be, uh, at this time, will not be originating any new Perkins loans unless there's, there's some type of uh, intervention that takes place within Congress where they make the decision to expand the program. So this is more of reference for you than anything. If you've seen at any other college uh, you know, award letters that you may have received, if it had the Perkins loan, that's gonna be at the discretion of those different colleges. So I just wanted you to be aware. If you do hear something in the news that all of a sudden there's a new uh, reauthorization of the Higher Education Act or some type of provision where this program is going to be extended, feel free to please contact us because we will at that time when we're hearing about that, we're gonna be making evaluations as to how do we move forward. We may be able to make funds available to those students that would meet those qualifications. So just kind of keep that one in the back of your mind. A little more information on the Parent PLUS loans. Again, this is a credit-based loan. Now, some parents have asked, do I have to make payments right away on this? Can I defer them? The answer is yes for both of those. You can make the decision whether or not you want to go immediately into repayment. The standard repayment term is gonna usually be 10 years. You can choose that maybe instead of making a full payment right away, that maybe I only wanna pay the interest that's gonna accrue, so that way I can keep the uh, the compounding effect in check. So I don't let that loan get out of hand. But if you choose, you can also choose not to have any loan payments made until your student graduates. If that's gonna be the case, that interest will continue to accrue. So you need to be aware of it. And again, the origination fee uh, that, will, that is in place uh, will be taken out of the loan proceeds once they are distributed to the college upon our request for your student. The private loans that we mentioned before, the list that we use is a historical list from the standpoint of these are lenders that our students have requested in the past, and these, these lenders have done a good job of taking care of our students. They have, we have not seen any instances of uh, abuse of the relationship or anything along those lines. They've been taken care of very well. So with that, the list that we have available is, is out there on, if you go out to our Benedictine website, the link is listed uh, at the very, uh, just under the, the header of this screen. If you go out to our website, and if you type in into the search bar student loans, you can scroll to the bottom of that screen, and there will be the link there. The thing that's nice about this is that if you are looking at different lenders for their options that they have to offer, you can, there's a tool there that you can place them side by side, and you can compare and contrast which ones you think would actually be the best one for your student, if that's the option you wish to, to utilize. And this is what the, the screen looks like uh, when they will end up going into uh, to look at alternative or private loans. Now, they will go through a form of, of an entrance counseling in this process as well. So again, our, 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 our desire is to make sure that our students, when they're taking on student debt, if that is necessary, that they're understanding what they're doing. We want to make sure that we're helping them out. 
Many people have asked about work study. If you've seen work study listed on your student's uh, award letter, uh, the amount that was awarded is a standardized amount. There's a good chance that your student may be eligible for a little more than that, but there's some challenges with that. There's, there's always a limit as to how much work study is available on any campus. So something to keep in mind, we've got this many jobs, but we've also got four classes of students, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors. So now what you've got in jobs here, you've got students who were freshmen, sophomores, and juniors this past year. They may have already secured their jobs. So now that job list from here now is down to here. So for beginning freshmen, it can be a little bit of a challenge in finding the jobs and probably most notably finding that job that they really want, you know, working in the library where they can do their homework instead of really having to do much. So from that standpoint, be aware that if you're looking for a job, there are going to be jobs that are going to be available. We utilize Hire Benedictine on our Benedictine website to help with, with putting our listing together of the different departments that have jobs available. The students will apply for those jobs and they'll go through an interview process just like they would out in the real world. From the standpoint of them getting jobs, the, one of the other things that can help is to keep their, their ears open because there will be seniors that are going to be graduating in December that may have a work study job. If they keep their ears open that, oh, hey, that job's going to be coming open, they can start making contact with those people to see if they can get their foot in the door for those opportunities. So when it comes to the work study, uh, Becky will talk a little bit more about some of the details of what's going to happen once they've secured that work study job. Uh, but be aware, we'll do everything we can to try to help them, uh, point them in the direction of being able to identify those job opportunities. Now, I talked before about the Raven Zone. When the students log into the Raven Zone, they will go into the link. Uh, if you're looking at your computer screen, there'll be three columns is the, is the layout of the website. The top center cell will say student self-service. That is where they're going to be able to view their financial aid. So with that, they're, they're going to, once they log into the financial aid portion of the, the Raven Zone, they will see a checklist just like this. And it operates on the, the, the normal, the, the color code of the stoplight. You know, red is bad, yellow means proceed with caution, green means you're good to go. So what they'll need to do, as you can see, there's some items that are green on there. That means they've already completed those items. Items that are yellow will have an open link right there for them to click on as to take them where they need to go. Now what you're seeing on the screen right now, and it's, it's hard to see right now, I understand, but the top one basically is telling the student, your award letter is ready. We need you to go accept your award letter. Just below that is going to have the, the requirements that they need to go out and complete their entrance counseling. And then the one below that says you need to sign your master promissory note. And then the very bottom one says you need to sign your award letter. So as they've completed these things, these items will check off. The signing in their award letter and accepting them, they will check off immediately once they've completed them. The entrance counseling and the master promissory note, once we get communication from the Department of Ed, those will come off. So the big key you really want to be looking at here, do I have everything green on my checklist? This is going to be the key. And in many cases, if, you, if the student calls or if you call, one of the things we're going to be pointing towards you, you know, well, is there, if the question is, what do I need to do? What does my student need to do? Have you checked the Raven Zone checklist? That's going to be the first thing we're going to point them to because those are going to be the keys to get them processing through like they need. Now, not only on this screen can you be able to view what they need to do on their award letter, but they can go in up in the top left corner and they can view uh, from any of these options. They can see a, a copy of their award letter. If you need to print it off for awards night at the high school or your own benefits, you can be able to have access to that information at, at your own discretion. So it is right, right there for you available. So from there, that's my section of the program. I'm going to go ahead and bring Becky up. Uh, Becky Miller is the bursar up in our business office. Uh, like we said before, once, once she's uh, finished, uh, we'll come back up and we'll have our question and answer session. Uh, if you've got any questions, please feel free to contact anyone in my office. We're more than happy to help you. That is why we're here. So I'll go ahead and turn things over to Becky. 
Thank you, Tony. And welcome, my name is Becky Miller. I'm the bursar here at Benedictine College. I'm in the business office, um, specifically over student billing and cashiering. Um, so we're gonna skip over. So how can the business office help you? Before I jump into this, I'll let you know, uh, Tony's right, they work on awarding the financial aid, and we do work on taking it away from your student. That is kind of our job, but we wanna make sure when, when we're done with this, you understand your options for making payments. Um, if you have any conversation you need to have with us, Tony referenced, sometimes circumstances change in a family. We wanna be there to have that conversation with you to get your student off on the right path. So that's really the goal of this. I'm also gonna ask anybody, anybody get their sleep shortened last night from the rain we had? Me too. So this is, pretty, this is pretty technical stuff Tony and I are going through. This document, you all have a handout and you have a Raven's Own handout. Take it home, look at it, it's the exact same presentation. Um, there's a lot here, I'm not expecting everybody to catch it the first time. Our contact information is at the end. Uh, please reach out to us, I've got a great staff. Our offices work very well together. Um, a lot of people confuse our offices, aren't sure where one begins and one ends, which is a compliment, I think, to how well we work together. So please let us help you and your student be successful in their transition to Benedictine College. So that being said, I'm gonna visit just a little bit about the payroll and human resources, which is also in the business office, but not really something that I handle directly. But I, I bring it up because I'm a parent of two students as well. Um, I understand there's a lot here, and my students both had work-study jobs at one point or another in their college careers. So the point I wanna make here is kind of for the benefit of the parent side of myself. I wanna share this with you, our HR director. I wanted to make sure you guys were aware of this as well. Um, Benedictine College hires in students as employees, no different than any other employer does in the United States. Every employer has to, per, to confirm eligibility to work in the United States. That is this I-9 form. Um, what that requires from your student as a worker of Benedictine College is original, unexpired documents. So at the, uh, the handout you have, there's the last page on that handout is a list of acceptable documents that the federal government allows Benedictine or any employer to take. The key to this is they have to be original and or, uh, well, and unexpired. It's not an or, it's an and. So yes, as a parent, it was a little nerve wracking to hand my student their original social security card and bring it to campus with them. So I asked our human resources director, Carolyn, I said, boy, couldn't we do that during SOAR weekend? Because I've had parents ask me, and I thought, boy, that sounds like a great idea. Unfortunately, the federal government will not allow us to do that until the, the individual has secured the job and they're actually going through that process. So it's kind of a balancing act. We cannot begin to pay them. They cannot begin working until we've completed the I-9 eligibility, and, the, and we can't do it too far ahead. So that's just more of a public service announcement for all those parents out there. Yes, you really do have to give your student their original documents. So when they call you and tell you that, just wanna let you know they're telling you the truth on that one. And the um, human resources contact information is at the bottom if you have any questions about that. So getting into the student billing side of things. Um, it's kind of ironic, Tony referenced it and it's true. Um, your students are moving into college. They're becoming um, adults in the federal government's world. Um, I have two students, remember? I kinda know as an 18-year-old that frontal lobe is not quite there. Um, but we have a responsibility and we wanna work with you to make sure we all get your student here and kinda get them on the right path to adulthood. Um, so the first thing, because in, in, the, in the high school career, parents took care of the bill, parents took care of everything. It was really a parent thing. So in college, it's a transition to the student's responsibility. Students responsible for their loan. Students responsible for their charges. That's a financial responsibility agreement. Um, Tony did correctly allude to the fact that the FAFSA also has on there the EFC, the expected family contribution. Well, it's somewhat ironic that the government makes the family contribute, but the student gets privacy and responsibility. So it's kind of a transition, and, and, and we're really here to help make that be as successful as possible while kind of getting your student off the ground into this aspect of the, the adult life. So they'll be signing a financial responsibility agreement. It's an electronic document. You, they have to do it to get to their bill online. Um, and we'll talk about it later. We don't mail statements home. So this, they're gonna see that, and it is your student accepting responsibility for educational charges while they're at Benedictine College. The second document, the second item here, which is really of interest to me and you, <laughs> is how we get you guys involved in helping your students while they're from the financial aspect of their life here at Benedictine College. Um, because again, 
um, the federal government has instituted FERPA, Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act. It gives your students privacy as adults, just like HIPAA does in the healthcare. Um, in short answer, we want to help your student be successful. We also know a component of that from a financial standpoint is getting you involved in this conversation. Um, your student has to give us permission to talk to you. And when I say us, I'm just talking about the financial aid and business offices. I'm not talking about student life, so that's a whole different subject. If you want to know why they got that fine on their account, you'll have to talk to your student directly. So federal law requires that your student gives us this permission, and they're going to do that. You also have a second handout, the Raven Zone, how to log into your student billing. Um, and it's a step-by-step -step for your student to get in and see their bill. The, the financial responsibility agreement is on there. Um, and then there's just a second step is how to set up authorized users. It's not limited to parents. It can be grandparents, any mentors, any person, an adult. Who, it could be an older sibling. I've talked to older siblings because sometimes they've just gone through the college process and they really understand it maybe better than, than mom and dad might. Um, you can have as many authorized users. The student can have as many authorized users as they would like. Uh, but they, they need to set them up through their, so they'll log into their Raven Zone account. They'll click the bill to, to go over and look and view and pay their bill. And we'll look at a screen here in a minute, but we use a third party called TouchNet. Um, it, they're a secure online service provider. They work with 600 colleges across the United States and actually around the world. So we're very fortunate to have that relationship with them. Um, and, and that's where your student will set up the authorized users that they want to receive emails and give us permission to speak to on their behalf. Because the, the reality is, if you mail a check to our office, if you log in and pay a bill, I can take that check from you. But I cannot answer any questions about your student's account balance without having this permission. So I really, you know, if, if we have to in a situation, your student can come in the office and, and sit there and give me verbal permission and we can have that conversation. But as soon as we get off that phone, I'm going to find a computer in my office and set your student down and get them set to have you set up so we can talk without having your student be interrupted from their class schedule. And just to be clear, this link will be a direct link for you or whoever the authorized user is to go to the to the TouchNet payment software. It is not a login to RavenZone. So we're not giving parents a login to the RavenZone. I just want to be clear about that. So student billing. So no paper statements will be mailed. In the interest of trying to be economical and provide real-time information to our parents, we, we, we don't invest time in staffing and postage and envelopes and mailing statements. And again, that RavenZone login will show you how to get in that step-by-step -step process and to see that bill. Um, so they'll be available online. Students will see them through their Raven Zone. They'll log in and then they'll click the view and pay my bill and it'll take them over and they'll be able to see their bill. Um, parents or the authorized users will be emailed a link after your student sets you up with your login information and the link that'll take you directly to TouchNet. We've also got that link saved on our website, the student billing website, so if you happen to misplace that email or it gets buried in your inbox, um, we've got that link. And there's a, if you've forgotten your password, it'll help you get reset. So we can help you make sure that that's successful for you. So the other point I want to make is, because we don't mail paper, paper statements home, we do present a bill each month around the 10th of the month. So they're going to be emails sent to the student's Benedictine College email address, which is very important for your student to be able to use. And that's how the college across all the offices really communicates with your student is through their Benedictine College email address. Now, they're going to be hearing about it. I know the students are hearing other versions from their counselors in these small groups. Um, I would encourage you, you know, because I know how, if your kids are like mine, they listen to every word I said, and it was so helpful, and I was so smart to them. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, but maybe you can let them see this website just when it, when it gets posted a week or two from now. Just say, hey, why don't you guys run through this real quick, and you can leave the room and kind of watch and see if they actually look at it. Point being here, um, their email address is very important. And, and I'll tell you, I've had students, my own included, who listen to their roommates or their friends or the teammate on the team. Um, oh, you, you know, that, you know. My parents took care of that. You don't have to worry about that email. You can ignore that email from the business office or from the financial aid office. I would encourage your student, and we tell them as well, we'd rather talk to you twice than not at all. Um, and, and we've had a little experience, a life experience, and I'm, I'm saying collectively because we've all been there. Making that assumption can sometimes lead to uh, things called late fees and holds on their account and things like that. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out, um, we do send it monthly. I think I mentioned that. It's really important because, 
and we'll talk about it here in a minute. The bill's due August 1. You know, we're going to present it the first week in July. You're going to think you've got everything set up, and you're going to say to your student, hey, we need, you know, we're going to go ahead and take your subsidized loan. Go out there and do your loan entrance counseling, master palm. And they're like, I got it, I got it. I'll do it tonight. I got, I got to go to work. I got to go, you know, somewhere this summer. I got to go hang out with the friends one more time. I'll do it later. Okay, so here comes August 1, you know, you've paid the balance or you've set up the, pay, you know, you, you've taken care of it. Well, all of a sudden around August 10th, you and your student, because you're an authorized user now, right, you're getting this email from the business office. And you're like, wait a minute, what is this email? We took care of this. So you log on maybe to the bill and you see, so there's some pending aid, but gosh, the loan's not pending there. What's the problem? So you log in and, and, and maybe ask your student to look in their Raven zone at their financial aid. And you can see, oh, they kind of didn't sign a master promissory note. You know, maybe they did one piece but not the other. So those online resources are really helpful. So that way you don't have to wait till business hours to talk to us and see what's going on with your student's account. But that's why I always encourage students and parents. We love that authorized user email because when we send that email to the student, the parent or the authorized user gets the same email. You know, it just tells you there's a balance, it gives you the number at the bottom, um, and then we're ready to talk to you about that. And we find that, that that relationship is the most successful to help the student be successful, help the parent get some peace of mind, and, and just avoid those late fees and things like that. Um, there is text messaging available in TouchNet. We kind of like that for a couple of reasons I'm going to talk about related to our installment plan. Um, I will warn you, uh, it goes out at 12.05 a.m. I get those, so I know, I know when they go out. That's an automated process they have. The student enrolls whoever it is. So, um, but I find it kind of helpful sometimes to get that text message when I'm on the go, because I'm not always checking my home email at night. Uh, and then the other thing, um, just talking about the two different types of statements that TouchNet offers, we load a bill. It'll, like I said, uh, first week in July, we'll be loading the bill for the fall, um, and then we, we present those monthly. So that's, when I say static presentation, it's like your credit card statement. It's at a point in time. So it's a, it's a pretty bill. It looks nice, and it's all laid out, you know, nice and pretty. The account activity is anytime you log in. So if your student changes, adds, and drops a course, that's going to be real time, and you're going to see that real time current balance and the impact of that. So that's why we like both of those views. So payment deadlines. Okay, so in high school, it was an annual bill. In, you know, you got your financial aid, it's an academic year. So you're seeing numbers on a yearly basis. Well, when it comes to billing, your students enrolled by semester, we bill by semester. So that's really important to kind of understand. This is where we start going on a semester basis. All your aid's going to be divided in half and applied like that. So, so those numbers you've seen annually, divide them in half. Um, and the bill or payment plan for the fall semester should be set up or paid by August 1st. Now we have different payment options we kind of talk about and in the next slide I'll talk more about the semester installment payment plan because I know that's of interest to a lot of our families. But I just want to point out again, you can log into your student's Ravenstone account, get to view and pay a bill, pay it that way, um, or as an authorized user you're going to have that link, direct link to TouchNet and you can use that link to make the payment. Um, we do take uh, e-checks online. We also take, you know, the credit cards listed up there. I will be real clear because I get this question every year. Um, Benedictine College does not pass along convenience fees to our families on the credit cards. I will be real honest. Yeah, I saw, yeah. I, really, that's a big deal. That's a very big deal. We understand the importance of offering payment options to our families. We get that. We really do. Um, I'll be honest. Um, KU, K-State, all the Kansas State institutions, they absolutely can and will. We're a private college, and Kansas doesn't allow us to do that, the state, so we don't. But we understand it's important for our families to have those options. Um, we have a lockbox with our bank. That's the P.O. box number you see there. So when you mail a check, it goes to our, our, the college's bank lockbox. That's why it's in Kansas City, Missouri. Please include your student's name and ID on that, because we get a volume of payments that way. Um, a lot of families have 529 plans, or grandparents, which is a great thing. We're very happy to work with you on that. Um, I know if you're in Missouri, uh, MOST is, is their acronym for their uh, 529 plan. A lot of them will mail to our lockbox, so that's easy. You know, you'll, you'll take care of that and just tell them what amount you need and send it that way. There are states where Benedictine has to get involved and we have to send things. Illinois, Florida, Texas. Um, reach out to, so at the, end of the, at the end of our slide, Laura Hammersmith, she's our cashier. 
She is the one who handles uh, managing our 529 plans where the college has to submit something on behalf of your student. So please reach out to her. She's got an email and a phone number, very helpful, and she's very knowledgeable. Um, we wanna make sure we get that done right for you on a timely basis. Um, we'll talk about payment plans in a minute. I just wanna, that last check mark, if you haven't set up a payment plan or your student hasn't set up a payment plan, hasn't paid the balance, hasn't gotten their loans kind of showing as pending aid by August 1, um, we'll put them on hold. What that means is they can't add or drop classes at that point in time without talking to us. And again, if you get the email about the hold, it's because there's something that's missing, some piece. So I would double check their loans, I would double check, you know, or, was there an outside scholarship you turned in for your student that maybe isn't showing yet? Um, so just keep, be aware of that. Late fees get applied the 25th of each month. So we send an email about the 10th. If you get the email or your student on your student's account, reach out to us, you know, talk to your student, make sure you resolve that before the 25th of that month because late fees do go on. We really don't wanna put late fees on, by the way. We really don't. Um, so payment plans, we, again, by semester, four or five month plans are available each semester. Uh, the five month begins in July, the 15th of each month. Um, so when we, when we present those bills around July 5th, um, they'll be online. We'll email all the student BC emails. We'll email the authorized users and say, hey, go look, your bill's ready. Go set it up, check out your charges, make sure your aid's where you want it. And this is kind of the nice piece. Tony mentioned the outside scholarships. And we are blessed here to have a lot of smart students, and, and we really like that about our student body. And one of the benefits of that, that you like, your students worked hard, they got some outside scholarships. So maybe you don't have a check in hand, but you send in that letter and financial aid has documented that, that's gonna lower your balance. Your, we, we show it as pending aid. And that's really a nice feature that, that I don't know if all colleges do that, to be honest. Um, but we wanna help our students lower their installment plan, lower their total balance due, um, because some of our students get pretty nice scholarships. These are awesome scholarships. So just the key is getting that documentation. I had a parent email it to me this past week, and maybe they, because I talk about it here because it, it lowers the bill. I just sent it right on to financial aid. Um, and, and so it does, again, we're, we work very well together. Our goal is to get that balance as low as where you want it to be to get the balance taken care of. So um, payment plans, as soon as we send that email, you can enroll. The point I wanna make related to payment, there's an application fee each semester. The payment plans don't accrue interest. Um, they're due the 15th of each month. Late fees go on the 25th, just like our other late fees. Um, the one limitation of touching our third party software is that whoever login does the enrolling in the payment plan is the login, is the email address that gets the notification of the installment. Now you can set up automatic payments, you can schedule payments so you don't have to think about it again, but TouchNet, we still send an email to you, whether you schedule it or whether you don't. If you're in a payment plan, you're gonna get an email reminding you that balance is coming up. Um, the email goes to who's ever login did the enrolling. So if you guys were in your student's Raven Zone login and then went through to TouchNet, your student's gonna get that email. This is kind of where that uh, text messaging alert kind of comes in handy. Uh, we've been talking to TouchNet to say, hey, authorized users should get every email from a financial standpoint that our students get. We're working with them on that. But in the meantime, this is a workaround they gave us. So this is where getting that text alert is helpful because then you guys get the same notifications that your students get. Um, and it's very helpful if you need to, you know, move some money around to make sure it's there to make that installment payment. Um, I talk about the, uh, your payment plan budget is going to include any pending aid and any pending scholarships you've got on your student's account. Um, we kind of give it through the August 15th installment, so the August 25th late fees. Um, by September 1, if that aid, if, if your outside scholarship check is not here for your student, we're gonna flip over to what I'm calling the actual balance, and you're gonna get an email notification or a text alert or whoever the enrollee was says, hey, your payment plan amounts have changed. And you're gonna be like, wait a minute, why? Well, it's gonna tell you what it was, what it is, and you're gonna log in and look at the bill and you're gonna be like, oh man, the outside scholarship's gone. And so then you're gonna either call us and we're gonna say, you know what, you need to get a hold of that outside scholarship organization because the check's not here. I will, I will tell you a true story from last academic year. Um, we worked with an, an, a family, uh, the parent got involved, we talked with a scholarshiping organization, they had mailed us a check, they had the correct address, we, we checked, 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 couldn't figure it out. They sent us a second one, um, it wasn't coming to us as well, we finally figured out the check ended up in the student's campus box. So you might just tell your student to make sure they check their campus box on occasion as well. 
yeah. It's okay, though. I mean, you know, we do the best we can. And that's where communication becomes very important because we knew this family was actively working and the scholarshiping organization was. And one of the things I really like about our students and our parents, we've got some great, we are very fortunate to have great students and parents. Um, we have honest dialogues. It is a, uh, we, we have, um, the honesty and the integrity that we have is very impressive, and I appreciate that. So I just want to talk for a minute about refunds. Um, sometimes students, uh, parents, borrow more than what they need to pay tuition and fees. Maybe you're going to buy books with it. Maybe you need to buy a computer. So we have refunds. Now, we don't do the first refunds until after the semester has started. So if you're looking to borrow money to buy books, we can help you. If there's a credit balance on your student's account, we can issue what's called a book voucher. Give the, our office a call, the business office, and you can use, your student can use the book voucher to purchase books through the college's virtual bookstore. Um, it's an easy process. We don't have to get you that check. We see the credit pending. We see all the charges are there that we expect. Um, so we can issue a, credit, a book voucher for up to the amount of that credit on their account. And then if they don't spend it all, then they get the, the balance back. So it's not, we don't retain it. It's, um, it's just there for them to use. So that's kind of a nice feature. Um, sometimes people um, make the payment and purchase that computer and they get reimbursed from their 529 plan through the college. And so then the credit ends up on the student's account. Um, you can get that refund issued two different ways. It's going to be, there's an electronic refund, which again, the student can enroll um, in the TouchNet process, and it's the student, it's the bank account the student chooses. So as an authorized user, you can't enroll in e-refunds, but your student can enroll in e-refunds. So you can work with your student to determine what bank account you want that to go to. It's fast, it's secure, it's, it's very easy. Um, or the paper check of the refund gets mailed to the student's home address. Uh, for the reasons stated earlier, we don't put refund checks in campus boxes. So I also want to just give you a view. Um, the handout you have, that the how to log into your Raven Zone, the student billing, um, TouchNet has upgraded their view literally just this week. It went live with production. So this is the new view of what TouchNet looks like. The coloring is different. Um, the blue, this was their test version, so that blue bar, it's white all the way across. Um, I just don't want you, you're going to be like, wait a minute, this does not look the same. It's the same software, it's the same environment. They just upgraded the version. They made it a little easier to read for eyes like mine. Um, so I'm grateful for it. It's a little bit bigger font. Um, it's, it's, it's the same content, basically. It's just supposed to be easier to, to navigate and follow. I guarantee you, your students will pick it up just like that. <laughs> it takes us a step or two longer, but they'll get it. So this screen is mainly just up here, just to, just to give you this information. You worked very hard to get your student to this point in time. Your student has worked very hard to get themselves positioned to move into college and transition. Benedictine wants to be here to help that transition be as smooth as possible. That being said, sometimes things happen out of everyone's control. A medical issue may arise. Um, things happen. This slide is just to make you aware so you can help make your student aware of, of the withdrawal process and the policies um, so Benedictine College's tuition and fee withdrawal policy is not the same as the Department of Education's on federal student aid. And typically that will result in an imbalance where the student has a balance remaining. And this is where it kind of circles back and it's like, okay, student, this is, this, is, this, this is on you. So this is here just to make, just to give this information and provide it. Now that being said, there's a lot of things that happen. Students have a lot of things going on when they move into, you know, they move onto campus. They might be by themselves really for the first time, away from home. There's a lot of activities, trying to make friends, trying to get the swing of all their class schedule and be in places on time. There's a lot going on for our students. It's natural to feel overwhelmed. I know if you haven't heard it already, you're gonna hear from Student Life and they're gonna talk about that. I talk about it here just to let you know and reassure you. Benedictine College, across every department, we want to help your students transition and be successful. So I want you to understand, if your student calls you and is a little nervous, a little homesick, maybe their first quiz didn't go the way they wanted it, they're just they're like, you know what, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be here, maybe I need to be home. Say, wait a minute, you know what, we've got a student success center here on campus, it's right by the dining hall. Hey, have you swung down there and talked to them? What about that professor? Have you talked to them? You know what, our professors are great and they want to work one-on-one. -on -one. Both of my students have talked to professors. It's the way it works here. Professors want to help your students. They want to be available. They've got upper level students who are tutors for them. You know, there are study groups. These are just things to be aware of. Um, 
we, you know, the RD in your, in your the residence hall director, your RA is a residence hall assistant. They are students that live on the floor with your student. So they're like a year older usually. They've got that experience. They can talk to them. Um, if they're on a team, an athletic team, uh, the coaches are great resources. Um, you know, older, you know, the, the, the upperclassmen are great resources. Um, we have a student health center that has a, a nurse, that has counseling. Um, it's at no cost to your student. There are so many places that your student can go talk to somebody just to get kind of recentered and refocused. Encourage them to use those resources. Encourage them just to, to they'll work through it and they'll be fine. It's normal, it's very normal. Um, just encourage them to, to stick with it. They can do this. It's like I tell my kids all the time. Um, college is more like a marathon. This is not a sprint and, and they just need to manage and pace themselves and be successful. Um, is it a perfect thing? No, but just let them know. It, it, we're here to help them be successful at this. We want to see them graduate and walk across that stage just as much as you do. So I wanna talk a little bit about Raven Bucks. Um, so your student's gonna get an ID card. Um, and that ID card is gonna have several things on it, on, on the, the swipe. Encourage your student to treat it like a debit card. I mean, secure it the same way. It's gonna have their meal swipes on there. It's going, and, and, and the meal plan comes with something called dining dollars. A lot of people have questions about this. We'll talk a lot about it here. Student Life will talk about it. We'll talk about it at move-in weekend in August again. Dining dollars come with the meal plan, the 18 meal plan your student is assigned. They're gonna get $150 each semester. That is a use it or lose it. So the, the, the swipes, the meal swipes are in the dining hall. But there's a Cafe 62 that has a coffee shop in Farrell Academic Center. Pretty good coffee, actually. Um, there's a Monte Casino in the MCI, the restaurant in Haverty Center. Um, those take our students' dining dollars. And those are dollars. It's only on-campus dining. Um, you know, and it's 150, so they want to use that in the semester because they'll lose whatever is unspent at the end of the fall semester and they'll get the next 150 at the beginning of spring. Raven Bucks are purchased by your students. It is your student's account. It's also on their card, so they'll use one card for all of this. Uh, they'll need Raven Bucks to do laundry on campus, a dollar to wash, a dollar to dry. Um, they will, can use it at other places. The Raven store is a great example because beyond the shirts, in the middle of the semester, if they need a, a chemistry lab notebook, they've got it at the Raven store. If they need an engineering mechanical pencil or a poster board, or you know, just things like that. And maybe they don't have a ride to get across town to Walmart. The Raven store has those things available for them and they can use Raven Bucks to purchase it. So Raven Bucks are very helpful. Uh, again, different from dining dollars and we'll keep talking about that. That is not an unusual, comp, you know, rest assured we'll help you get that figured out. You will need to put the Raven Bucks on your student's account. That IT sheet that Tony talked about, your Raven Bucks login is on there. You can log in and the next screen will show you what the login looks like, it's pretty basic. Um, you can also purchase those on move-in weekend. We'll all be relocated to the library and we'll be able to help you uh, get those purchased for your student's account. It rolls over from semester to semester. So you don't have to spend all the Raven Bucks at the end of the fall semester, it just rolls with your student. That's what that login, it's like I said, pretty generic. You'll get to it through our college, uh, through our resources link on the website. And then there's our contact information. So Tony, if you wanna come back up, Tony and I will take questions now. And uh, we appreciate your time. I know it's really, this is, use that document, use that resource, give us a call. Our login information is on the website, um, our login, our contact information. But we're really here to help you make sure this is a smooth transition. Uh, Becky made a good reference earlier with regards to the student emails. Your students are now going to be a part of our Benedictine family. As much as we love to know how their day is, or if everything's going well for them, if we're gonna be sending an, an email to them, whether it's from Becky's office or mine, usually that's because we need to have, have them com uh, communicate with us regarding a, uh, maybe we've got some missing documentation, something that needs to be handled. So uh, if you would please uh, you know, reiterate to your students the importance of, uh, if they get an email from us, please address it. And, and we may need to make sure uh, We've got the capability to where the students have the ability to have their, their Benedictine emails you know, forwarded to their Yahoo or Gmail or whatever. We need to make sure that they are doing that so that way we are able to keep a good, good uh, communication flow with them. So we want to work with them. So um, I think what we'll do now is we'll open things up for a few minutes here for 
uh, for any questions. So does anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am, right here. So you would get to the link for the virtual. Hang on. We just make sure we, oh, just, yep, we yep, just want yep. to make sure that everyone can hear. Uh, the question was about being able to access uh, the the Raven or the virtual bookstore, whether you can do it with with your Raven Bucks or through the Raven Zone, how that's done. So, thank you. Um, so the virtual bookstore is the college's bookstore. It's on the website. You'll go into our resource quick links, and it's just virtual bookstore. And actually, you will want to go there with your student schedule and see every book that professors require. They will, so everyone will need to be able to get there and look at that information. So if, you're, if your student's in English 1020, you're gonna, and, and they're with, and I can't think of a professor, Dr. Mulholland, if, I don't know if he teaches that, but so you would go to the virtual bookstore, look that up, and put in the professor name, because it'll be right on the student schedule, and you'll see the books that they require, books that are optional, uh, and you can purchase there, you can rent, through the virtual bookstore. I know some families will go to Amazon, you know, so you'll have the ISBN number. It's real key to get that information from the professor, you know, that they want, and the virtual bookstore will have that information on it. So I think, was your question directed to purchasing? Okay, so her question was how to make payment on those books when you purchase them. So you can absolutely use your own personal credit card. Um, so it's, it's a third party that Benedictine partners with to purchase and have those books available. Um, if your student has a credit on their tuition account because maybe you borrowed extra plus loan to pay for those books, reach out to us in the business office. We'll validate and see that there's a credit on there. And then we, if it's $500 credit, we'll set up what we call a book voucher for that $500, and then your student will key that number. We'll give them a, a unique number, and they'll key that in to make that payment because we'll set it up behind the scenes. So Raven Bucks, to your question specifically, are not available for purchasing books through the college's virtual bookstore, no. Yes, ma'am. Do the books need to be new or can they be used? Do the books need to be new or used? They can be whatever your student is comfortable using. There are also electronic books available through the virtual bookstore, so you can rent those as well. Um, I'm a paper person, but our students these days are not necessarily paper. Um, so it's really whatever your student is comfortable with. I remember speaking with, with my daughter uh, when she was finishing up her degree, and I asked her about the different options that students were using. You know, some students will say, well, I'm going to use Amazon because I think it's cheaper. Or, or a Chegg is another one that is commonly used. The one thing that you, you really want to look at when you're evaluating costs, you also want to make sure that you're addressing deliverability. Uh, what happens if by chance they order a certain book and the wrong book comes? You know, what is the return policy of whoever they're purchasing from? Uh, those factors can play in, especially if a student waits until the beginning of August to get their books. Um, you, you want to keep those things all in mind, not only just, just the dollars and cents. And a great point to that, Tony, is sometimes in this day and age, there's a lot of technology supplements to books. So if you purchase a used book, make sure it has any technology that comes with that book, whether it's an audio, I, I, don't, I can't even think, a clicker, I mean, I can't even begin to explain all the technology that some of these books have. So I'd encourage you to maybe look at the new book and see the pieces that come with it and make sure your used book comes with that. There's a lot of, and even the College Virtual Bookstore also has what they call a marketplace. So you can buy a new book, you can go out to the marketplace to buy used books, and so, and then they've got, so it's very similar to Amazon in terms of they'll have ratings on them to see if they're, you know, reliable. So, but, but that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Yes, over here on this side. The question is, is how are the loans and grants from the federal standpoint uh, dispersed to a student's account? According to federal regulation, we are required to put them on, uh, on a, since we are a semester-based school, so you've got half of the charges that a student will receive of their annual basis, as Becky referred to, will be in the fall, and the other half will be in the spring. We will do the same thing with regards to the student loans, the Pell Grants, things along those lines. We will disperse them 50-50 on those bases, yes. Yes, ma'am. Where do the books come in once they're ordered? And that is a great question. So you can, you can choose to have those mailed to your home address. So the bookstore should be open, um, and we'll put that in the email. I, I think July 11th is the date. We'll, have, we'll verify that. 
Um, so the virtual bookstore will be open July 11th. You can choose to mail them to the college. If you do that, make sure on the shipping address you put your student's name as well as the Benedictine College uh, mailing address. If it comes into our mailroom, Rocky's Copies is the name of the mailroom, they'll have to open them to see. And they, get, they do, a lot of students, especially returning students, will have their books shipped here. Um, you can go either way. Uh, but again, if you have it shipped here, make sure you use 1020 North 2nd, Atchison, Kansas, and the zip code here for the college. We've had students who put in 1020 North 2nd and their, you know, their city and state where they fr they're from. So, uh, but make sure you put your student's name on that shipping address. Yes, ma'am. Does the virtual bookstore rent books or just purchase? You can rent, yes. Yes, uh, but, but you'll, want to, you'll do that directly with the, the bookstore, so you'll want to read that information online as you're evaluating it. So, and I think this gentleman here, in the, yeah. yeah. Great information. Thank you very much. Uh, as if, for those of you who might not have been able to hear, be aware when you're ordering your books that there's an international version of it because it may not necessarily be everything you're getting, especially if that price tag looks very attractive for you. So I. Sure. Amazon. Yeah, through those other sections. Yeah, because a lot of people will look at, okay, what's the cheapest I can get by? That old saying, you know, you kind of get what you pay for, so you need to worry about that. Um, we're, we're, as we're going along, I think we're going to answer one more question, and then uh, as we move forward uh, with, with the agenda of everything going on today, we will, there's a, I believe the next session starts at 1130. Uh, we will be here available up front here to ask any, answer any questions, Becky, myself, and my colleague Tim Wolf. Um, so we'll, let's go ahead and answer this. Yes, sir. Okay, when, when do athletic and academic scholarships show up on the Raven Zone? Okay, once, once we have actually completed the student's award package and they've received, uh, they should receive a notice in the mail that uh, you, you have the actual award letter, that award letter is generated from the same information that's on the Raven Zone. So if, it's not, if you're not able to see it, then please just contact us because there may be a field that we need to fill in that opens it up for you to be able to see. So if that's not available, please let us know. We can be able to do that really, really quickly. So we can do that. So, um, so with that, uh, we've got to uh, believe the next session starts at 1130 with the, uh, with the, uh, student, the Raven student group. Uh, we will be available here for the next few minutes. If you don't have any questions, if you'd like to, uh, whether you want to stay for that session, I know... Uh, Katie mentioned that there's also, uh, if you want the opportunity for a walking tour of the campus, uh, those are available starting at 1130 as well. So uh, with that, um, on behalf of Becky and myself, we want to thank you all for the time this morning. Thank you. And we hope you have a great experience here this weekend. Thank you very much.